Okay. So yes, as I said, I've worked with middle school students, um, but I'm going to tell you a little about me and we'll get to know each other through this experience. Okay, I'm a New York City SLP. I'm from White Plains, New York. I'm a mom and I define myself as an abolitionist educator. That means I'm quite serious about uh, making sure that all children get a fair break. But due to you know societal differences and things of that nature, black and brown children have not always gotten a fair break. And at this time, oopsie. I would like to get to know some of you. So I'm going to put a Kahoot into the, a Kahoot link into the chat. Let's see. I'm going to put a Kahoot in the chat and then we could uh see where who everyone is it's taking a minute sorry can you guys see the white screen like i'm seeing oh uh, yes do you see loading yes yes okay good i'm just checking Believe it or not, I had this already set up, but this, see when I make my wild plans and I want to entertain everyone at the same time. All right, come on, computer. Okay, oh, look at this, we're getting ready. Okay, here's our pen, 403. 403941. We're going to get to know one another. That's the terrace. Wait, where's the link? Um, You just have to put in Kahoot it, and then you'll come right to this. Sorry. I'll, I'll put this into the chat right here. That's okay, Sora Mary, if you don't have your phone. You can just shout it out. We're informal. to join signed in. Okay, I'm going to get ready to get it started. 
Anyone having difficulty? You can unmute yourself and say. All right, let's get Darlene. Are you signed in, Darlene? I I don't know. I put in the Kahoot it. So well, once you get to Kahoot it, it's gonna take you to put your pen in. And the pen is what's oh. on the screen. Uh oh. And then it's gonna say make up a nickname or something. Oh, okay. Guess I go back to chat. Right? Yeah. You can just either you could just put Kahoot hit it into your browser or on your phone and it's gonna take you to this to the screen and it'll have prompts. Okay. Are you good? Well, my browser, you mean you can do that. You can do it. It's better actually if you do it from your phone so you have a separate device to look at it from the screen. Okay, so I, that means I need to come out of Zoom. I've got to no, come out. Oh, you're on your phone doing the Zoom? Yeah. Don't worry. Then just shout out the answers. Don't worry. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, I think I lost one. Who did I lose? Okay, you're back. Okay, I'm going to just start it. It's just an uh, icebreaker. Okay, let's see. Ruby. Get to know you, SLP. All right. Okay, what population do you work with at present? Even if you're not an SLP, you can just put the age grade. Preschool, elementary, middle school, or high school? Okay, we mostly elementary. Well, you know what? To tell the truth, elementary and preschool are the ones that that's really where we're going to make our best impact, in my opinion, in my opinion. What if you're with both? Sorry, I'm middle and high school. <laughs> you could be, well, you could just write one. You could just write one. But would you agree as a middle school and high school person, the impact is stronger with the younger ones? Yeah, but I love my my high school students. I do, no, I love my middle school students. <laughs> I, but I just wish they had gotten more intervention when they were younger. That's a fact. I understand. Yeah, just when they were younger. All righty. Let's keep it moving. Let's keep it moving. Here's another poll. How long have you been a clinician? Zero to three, three to seven, seven to 15, 15 plus years. I'm retired. Okay. And I worked across all grades. All right. Okay. We have some seasoned people here. Seasoned. Yes. All righty. Moving along. How comfortable are you addressing reading problems? Totally uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, but I do address it somewhat comfortable. It's second nature. Okay, somewhat comfortable. Okay, so most of us are un are pretty comfortable. I'm I'm happy no one's totally uncomfortable because <laughs> even though you know it, it's not always easy and it doesn't always fix all the issues, it it's necessary. How do you feel about clinicians addressing reading deficits? It's not our job. Don't the schools have reading specialists? It's in our scope of practice, but there's no time. It's okay, especially for younger students. Who's bet? Who is better than the SLP on the educational team to address reading deficits? Where do you stand? Oh, well, <laughs> I can see what you're saying. It is better with younger students. It's not our job, but is it really not our job? That's what I say. Okay, let's keep it moving. On your caseload, how many students have reading problems? Zero to 25%, 25 to 50%, 50 to 75%, 75 to 100%. Okay, I I'm with you.
with the 50 to 75% range. I'm I'm in that group. I'm in that group. And then I, I some, you know, some years, depending on the year, I could be in the 75% to 100%. Okay, here's a word cloud. What hinders you from addressing reading issues? If you could just put something in the chat. We'll see what we get. Well, that is true. Not enough time. And parents, uh, the, I'm not sure. Are we saying parents, other concerns, like they have concerns that are more important than reading? It depends on your population, to be quite honest. Um, I just feel like I don't have enough experience, nor do I have the appropriate assessments to address those deficits. Alrighty. That's cool. I, I see you. okay when do you soar in your practice this is for everybody when are you doing your best thing? whether it's dealing with reading or not when do you soar in your practice When we collaborate, oh yeah, that's true. And when you're with, how come nobody said when they're doing their paperwork? <laughs> when you're doing billing, that's when I saw. Okay, well, we're gonna go get into the meat of our work tonight and our discussion. Okay, we've gotten to know each other. You guys can see my screen fine. Are you, is everyone yeah. can see the PowerPoint? It's, okay, cool. Hello, my name is. Mm -hmm. All mm -hmm. right, great. I just have to check in because sometimes the technology isn't always working with me. All right. So we're going to go over as something that we all know that what our words are tools for, like as just, as just human beings. My name is Why? Why? Okay, so you know our words help us think. So this is why we're so critical to talk. Well, that's so basic, right? To read to the future, to problem solve, and that's why some of our students have so many like interpersonal issues. Um, to get along with others, to understand, and to imagine. So that's why we like these core skills, we really need to be uh, addressing them along with, I believe, reading. We do need to address reading. So I'm gonna hear some outcomes. After this workshop, um, I wanna give everybody instructional methods and supports for, and a list of methods and supports for working on decoding, but also working on comprehending because some sometimes like, and I understand as SLPs, we don't want to get caught up in decoding and phonics when we can get down to helping un students understand the vocabulary, helping students understand the relationships between um, different, different words. So we want to, and then I want to give you a list of the resources that I have found effective. Now, um, back at the beginning, I said I am an abolitionist. Um, educator. And I'm going to get into that. As I said before, that so many times black and brown students do not get what they want. But the, here's a definition by Dr. Love. Abolition, abolitionist teaching is really about trying to create a school system that is loving, just, and affirming to all students, not just black and brown students, and to think about policies, rules, procedures that are oppressive and unjust. 
And what's truly unjust is to get to the eighth grade and read on a first or second grade level. That's truly unjust. And so my role as an abolitionist instructor is to make sure as a speech therapist, to make sure that when a child, when I encounter a child in the sixth grade and I see that they're reading on kinder grade le level, that I know that's the thing that hurts them probably the most, like in their spirit. And my job is to, as their advocate, their speech and language pathologist is to help. Um, I'm not saying that, like say if you come to me kindergarten, first grade and sixth grade, I'm not saying in the eighth grade, you'll be on grade level but at least to get you up to a more functional level, like maybe third or even fourth grade, I, I think that's doable in three years. But it does take a lot of work and it's a lot of work on the part of the school and the parents and a lot of collaboration. And you will see that today in my workshop. Okay, oopsie. Okay, so for some of us, um, I heard this, and this is the point. I'm going to highlight some parts. Um, SLPs, we're, we serve an integral role in helping students become literate. This, um, this includes the prevention of reading and writing disabilities. Like say with those of us working with younger students, and we see that they have um, phonological processes or uh, developmental articulation problems. We can help them a lot by giving them by giving them opportunities to take apart and put together sounds. And we can be kind of protective from having some of these problems that some students are having later. But also these goals, ASHA speaks to us. To accomplish these goals, SLPs require adequate, adequate training and education on reading, development, assessment, and treatment. And I will say New York City is beginning to do that. We've had workshops where they are teaching us how to assess a person to see if their speech and language problem is related to dyslexia. If it's dyslexia alone, then we'll let the teachers have it. If it's dyslexia and a language problem, we'll all handle it. So, but all of this is from collaborative work and it's from training and it's, it's incumbent upon the school system. It's incumbent upon us as clinicians to get that training. Okay, and this is further proof that speech therapists have a definite role in helping students with literacy problems. All of these programs from, well, LIPS, Linda Mood Bell also gave us visualizing, verbalizing, which is the comprehension component of reading. And then we have LIPS, the phonological um, and the phoneme part of reading. Then we have SPELL too, which I really like. I think this, this speech therapist worked with Linda Mood Bell and did the LIPS. And she did the visualizing, verbalizing, and then she brought in the component of orthography, how how strong that is for helping students read. And then like Linda Boo Bell again, I'm gonna go back to that, seeing stars. And then we have lively letters, which I feel is so similar to lips. It's incredible how similar it is to lips um, that, I think it's lively letters is just better for younger kids because they have the cute little pictures and stuff like that. But I think it's very similar to, it's incredibly similar to lips. But lips, they did say they had a lot of problems with people, you know, taking ideas from them. Okay, so what is our role? Okay, we're here to advocate for our kids train staff and parents. Like right now I work with a young man who the reading work I do with him, his para does the days that I don't see him also. And he does it in class. Provide therapy that addresses this need. I mean, say if I have a sixth grade girl, all she really wants to do is learn to read. And so our therapy addresses that because my therapy has to be relevant to her and what she needs. And to counsel and educate students, like say right now, we do talk about the hippocampus in short-term memory. And we also do talk about the neocortex. So the kids can understand that this is not like uh, some problem that they have that's like just so like something so wrong. So they can understand what that is something going on in their body and that it's some, there are ways we can help them. Okay, so here's the mechanics of reading. I know you all know this. Decoding and language comprehension, that equals reading. If one component is missing, 
you're not truly reading. Like, you know, how some people are hyperlexic and they can read everything, but they don't understand it. It's, it's, a, it's decoding, but it's not really reading. And this, and as we know, this is what re decoding requires: phonological awareness. You have to, be, oopsie, you have to be aware of the sounds. Ortho orthographic awareness: we need to know those letters. Morph morphologic awareness: we need to know those um, sound checks, chunks, and letter sound knowledge to know which sounds go together. And then that's kind of difficult because we know with our vowels, like you might learn a e i o u, and sometimes y but we all know that that's not really the truth of what students have to learn in order to read. Tell me if I'm going too fast, anyone. If they have, jump in if you have a question or you wanna add on. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a snapshot of the students I work with at my school. Um, my school is sixth, seventh and eighth grade. Our city has 22% students with IEPs. We have 28%, so we're a little ahead of the school. The city has 6% special classes. We have 11%. The city has 14% English language learners. This was as 2022. Things may have changed because we know that the demographics have changed quite a bit in the city, especially after COVID with so many students leaving and so many people coming in like with our new immigration things going on. So in 2022, it was 14%. Now, it's, and in our school was 13%. Economic need, 71% is the city, 94% is my school. And we do know that economics do influence our language ability. There's a relationship. There's just a, a, a real relationship. Because when you when there are deficits with money, there's often deficits with educational uh, means. Just like when I was um, telling about the movie Right to Read, how they were saying how with some parents, they notice their children aren't reading on time. And then they get them like tutoring, just phonics tutoring, and they resolve the issue. If a parent doesn't have that economic ability, the issue sometimes compounds. Okay, so this is just a glimpse of our seventh, a sample of a seventh grade self-contained class. That's our smaller classes. Out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve 12 students, two are under second grade reading level. We have some in the third grade range, which in seventh grade, that's not good. But in third grade, you can read a, a small chapter book. So, and we have some, look, we have some fifth grade range but the self-contained those are the most needy students so it's not it's not unheard of for there to be some lag between their um their grade and their level of reading but second grade that's very scary and even the third grade is a little bit scary because those students may actually be able to decode the third graders but how much they truly understand is questionable and then this is our ICT class, a glimpse of a seventh grade ICT class. They are, um, you'll note most of the students, some students are ahead. We have some in the fifth grade range, which isn't horrible. It's not horrible. But look, we have students under, under the third grade range, even in the ICT class. That's a bigger class where there's two teachers one who handles special education needs, one who handles the the mainstream needs, and they um and they work to just help students that might need a little boost. I'm sorry if I can interject because I'm a retiree from the Department of Education, in New York City. Yes. ICT, I think, is a relatively new term. We used to call it either pushing or collaborative, where we had those two teachers. We, the that's the collaborative. Push, yeah. like push in and pull out. That would be like sets where they pull the student right. out. And I think I've seen that be like, I had a little boy, he was a first grader. Yes. And he got sets and he got the ICT with the two teachers. Yes. Made it to grade level because he needed yeah. that extra push. That's why that push is so, and he got speech. That, and he had phonological processes, which speaks to 
some of our kids with phonological processes, they are at risk to have reading yeah. problems. Which which brings up another, I used to do, I used to do a lot of evaluations. Um, yeah. I forget what they called it, that extra when you made the overtime, oh, I forget the word now. Okay. But I, it, I was an evaluator for seven years for the preschool assessment team. And I also mm -hmm. did school age, you know, evaluations. And that was something that a decision I had to make was that is set enough for this particular child that's showing more academic issues, especially like reading. Sometimes it was, and then other times I needed to do both. I recommended both sets and um, speech, speech and language therapy or treatment. So, you know, so that's a decision so depending on how they scored on the test and what, you know, and what I'm, and what was presenting, what I was seeing. So exactly, exactly. I think that, you know what I say for the younger students, give them as many interventions as possible, because if this could get resolved yeah. when you're younger, oh, it's yeah. so much better. It's so, or even if it's, I'm not going to say in these instances, everything is ever truly fully resolved, but we could teach the person how they learn. We could yeah. teach the child how to help themselves. And that's the goal of therapy anyhow. Oh, yes. Yeah. Many of my students, the preschoolers, by the time they were at um, the turning fives, they I, I had to like convince the parents, they're okay, let the kid drive. <laughs> you know, they're, it's all right. You know, because they were so dependent on our services. But it was, but I needed to convince those parents that it's really okay because you're right, um, my sister, that that you know that when you get it early, the early intervention makes the difference. And it does. In, in most cases, I would say, yeah, I would say in most cases because we all know that our our brains have more plasticity when we're younger. Like, cause I know I can't do what I used to be able to do 15 years ago, so yeah, I know these. <laughs> It's over. It's wait, over. Wait, five, five years ago. Yes. <laughs> Forget about it. Yeah. <laughs> true, true. Okay, so here. But I, I did come down a little gloom and doom because of neuroplasticity and because they are still young, even though they're in middle school, they're still young, but we know at puberty language acquisition does get a little harder. And then also a lot of times we are who we are, but it is still fertile ground for middle schoolers for them yeah. to learn and get these literacy skills, listening, modeling, they can do it. Um, Academic skills. A lot of them have been in school all these years. So they've gained certain academic skills. We just got to push them that little bit more. And then also vocabulary growth. A lot of times as SLPs, especially with middle school, we're not so much working with um, all the reading, but going into those academic classes, finding out the vocabulary ahead of time and then practicing it in the class. So when they get in class, they could be a superstar. That's right. But New York City, we do have the New York City Literacy Collaborative. I don't know if it's everywhere, but in my school, I have to yeah. say, we have some wonderful young teachers who are abolitionist educators, and they've taken it upon themselves to get extra help to have people like in our principal. She's wonderful, highly intelligent woman, understands the issues, and she goes the extra mile to help the kids. So she, we do have a literacy coach who comes in, works with the teachers, and teaches them ways to help the students, especially in the self-contained classes, because that's where we see I'm going to say most of the literacy issues, but not all, unfortunately, yeah. not all. Not all. Okay. We have one program, Phonics for Reading. It's scripted. It's like, say, with lips. I don't know who's familiar with lips. There's a lot of chaining, changing sounds, taking one sound out, putting another sound in, um, and building that automaticity and fluency. So this is for students that are, um, I would say, reading at a, a lower, like under third grade, and they're in sixth, sixth grade, under third grade, maybe even under second grade. Okay. And um, then we have rewards. This is for students that are um, higher level readers, but you know, you have these students who, if they get to a longer word, they don't know how to break a word down. They don't understand like the word chunks, how they work yet. So this one is a wonderful program. We have teachers that do that as well. And if, and 
and I'm going to tell you the teacher's role, and then I, you'll get to see a little bit of what I do with these same students. And then we also are working on building fluency. Like say the thing is in our school, if a student is reading a sentence and they do it chopped up the first time, that's okay. But they have to go back and read it fluently because yeah. that's going to help them, their comprehension, their, you know, the practice, the practice, you know, practice, there's something to be said for studying and practice in um, solidifying things in our brain. And this is just an example of the phonics, how they pair it with a picture and the students go through this and they do this work independently and at first with a group and then independently. And these are sixth and seventh graders doing this work. But I'm going to share a clip with you briefly of a session that I did with us that I do with students with some um, reading difficulties. Fifth sound. First sound, second sound, third sound, fourth sound, fifth sound, good job. Here we go, first sound, second sound, third sound, fourth sound, fifth sound, what is the fifth sound? It. First sound, second sound, third sound, fourth sound, Fifth sound, right now it's Let's do this together. What's the word? Good job. What's the word? What's the word? Randy, what's the word? Go ahead, you can say that Say it again. Good. Say it again. Good. 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 All right. What's the sound? What's the word? What's the sound? What's the word? What's the sound? What's the word? These are in front of you too, though. So if you look at the paper, if you can't see it there. Second row, what's the sound? What's the word? What's the sound? What's the word? Lost. What's the sound? What's the word? Yes. Is this? What type of word is this? Yes. A name. How do we know it's a name? Oh, Oscar? It has, it has a capital J, right? So we know that it's the name of something. What's the sound? What's the word? Yes. Xavier, what's the word? All right, what's the sound? What's the sound? What's the word? What's the sound? What's the word? Okay, let's do this together. What's the word? What's the word? What's the word? Don't go ahead. What's the word? What's the word? What's the word? All right, good job. Please go ahead and do this. If you are done, just raise your hand and we'll check in. Okay, so you got a flavor for what we've been doing in our school and our uh and we I did this I do this collaborative with the classes the self-contained classes are very easy for me to be collaborative with but i i work inside the ict classes okay so we um here you're going to get to see where to go after the basic words like how to get these chunking and all that stuff and how to break down smaller chunks before you know before the child can can um do a, an entire word so we start with a lot of times with the compound words, like as you could see, like laptop, pancake, and it gives the kids a lot of confidence doing these things. So I'm gonna let you hear from another, um, another uh, one of the teaching assistants I work with. She's excellent and it's been a great experience for us to collaborate. You get more bang for your buck when you collaborate. Oh yeah. 
Hi, how are you? Hi. Please introduce yourself. My name is Ms. Roque. Um, I'm a classroom paraprofessional here at 303. Um, I've been working with the Department of Education for almost 10 years now. Okay, as a member of the team, please describe your experience working with students in the classroom and working with speech pathologists, OTs, and whoever you've encountered. Oh, I think it's amazing um, being a classroom para and most of the time being um, the second adult in the room is always great to have that other person in the room. Um, with my experience, having um, the speech therapist in the room while I'm helping another student has been amazing because they also get to give the child that one-on-one -on -one literacy help that they need throughout the courses. Okay, how did you feel, view speech therapy before collaborating and how do you view speech therapy now? Um, before I used to view it as um, a child getting pulled out, um, not feeling inclusive with the classroom, um, but now as the speech therapist is in the room, it almost feels like it's the entire room getting the feel of what it is to be getting help with the literacy that they need within speech. Okay, can you describe the impact on our kids of all the work we're doing with rewards and teaching them reading skills? Oh, we can see a huge improvement um, in the way that they're reading out loud, reading to themselves, um, and just overall sounding out words, putting sentences together, it has made a huge impact. Well, thank you, Ms. Roque. You're very welcome. Okay, you guys might be able to tell she's one of my favorite people. <laughs> okay, okay, and scaffolding. So we're gonna start out, you know, with, like I said, with the laptop, like pairing these simple words they've used before and just putting them together. Let me move this along. Okay, now here's a quick little session with these cuties now that they've grown up a little bit. Okay, today we'll be talking about compound words. Compound words are when you put two words together. Okay, it's going to help us with our reading and help us read longer words. All right. Ayani, can you tell us what a compound word is? A compound word is a word that puts two words in one. Yes, put together. Like, mm -hmm. uh, so let's, you guys ready to practice reading some before yeah. we get our text? Yes. Ayani? Uh, everything. Okay, this time everybody will get their own word. Ayani? Volleyball. Okay, Randy? London? Voice? Good. Ayani? Take your time. All right, so that was how, like with a, this is a group that's a more needy group with learning mm -hmm. words. Here, I'm gonna move it along a little bit because I think we're going a little late. Okay, okay, so we also, I found very helpful to kids that might be reading a little bit higher level is including prefixes and suffixes in their decoding skills along with including it as a way to understand words. So it's like a double bang for your buck. So we get that vocabulary component and we get the decoding component, as you can see, teaching. So let's move along here. These students can read for the most part, but Decoding longer words is difficult. And I try to get words from their curriculum. These are their social studies words. They were doing the Emancipation Proclamation. Who's heard this word before? 
studies. Very good in social studies. What document are you studying? Um, Abraham Lincoln made this document. What is it called? E Emancipation. There's a second word to it. Pro 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 proclamation. Because the word proclaim is in there. So we are going to practice reading longer words, but our word of the day will be emancipate. So our word is emancipate. I need a reader for the definition. Michael, will you read for us? Yes, without a Word of the day, emancipation. Emancipate. The act of free someone from the control of another, especially parents, relinquishing authority and control over a minor child, type of free liberation, beliefs, the act of liberty, someone or something. Now, when we were, when you all were discussing the Emancipation Proclamation in school and social studies, who was being emancipated? Who was being emancipated? Abraham Lincoln made the document, he made a big speech. Who did he emancipate? Who? Who was emancipated? Who did that document affect? It did affect the slave owners. How did it affect the slave owners, the emancipation? They had to let the slaves go free. Now, were all the slaves freed by the Emancipation Proclamation? No, which slaves were freed by the Emancipation Proclamation? I don't know if that's C-O-N. It does start with a C-O-N. Somebody help them out. Con. Say it, Michael. Uh, no, say it. I, I, if you were wrong, I would tell you. Con. The Confederacy. The slaves in the Confederacy. So African Americans that lived in border states, such as Maryland, West Virginia, and Delaware, and Kentucky, were they free? No, because those, those slave states were loyal. Oh, as you can see, we had a little social studies class there. You know, I want to make sure they were clear on the facts because they get tested. Yeah. Okay, so here we're going to see. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Now we're going to see the words they worked on. Who's heard this word before? Very good in social studies. What document are you studying? Okay, so here, this is, we're gonna go let's speed up a little bit. Here's another staff person talking about how we collaborate. Please introduce yourself. Hi, my name is Daytona Bradley. I'm currently in my ninth year teaching at CIS 303, and I am a seventh grade ELA SPED teacher. Okay, as a member of our interdisciplinary team, describe your experience as a team member. Um, I've had a lovely experience working on our interdisciplinary team, um, having members with different perspectives and different approaches to uh, pedagogical practices has really allowed for me to learn and improve my practices and create a better classroom environment for our kids. So a lot of the time if there are areas where I feel like I don't fully understand something and I have weaknesses, I'll have sometimes you Miss Higgs, you'll jump in and model something for me, especially for students who are like struggling um, with reading and specifically with phonics. I've had a lot of speech things uh, that I've applied in my classroom settings to help my kids be able to access the curriculum. Okay. How did you view speech therapy before collaboration versus now? Yeah, so um, 
Well, my initial exposure to speech therapy was when I was a student myself, and I would see a lot of students just being pulled out of the class, so not fully understanding what was happening with them. And then when I was in grad school, still not having a full understanding of what it consisted of. However, working here at 303 and having you as um, our speech therapist, I was able to see a lot of the skills that the students are going over and the different things that I could implement into my own practice as well. I think prior to having the collaboration aspect of it, it really felt isolated, but now seeing that what's happening and seeing you sometimes push in with students and have the work happen in class, it gave me a better understanding of what I could do to build on my practices, but also areas that I can further emphasize what was already happening in speech through my work as their ELA teacher with reading and writing practices. Well, thank you. I learned a lot from you as well. Aww. Okay. Describe the impact on our kids, especially like our literacy practices. Yeah, so I think one, the first thing is the collaboration uh, between everyone really destigmatizes the idea of students needing like speech therapy. Sometimes it's seen as a negative, but with you coming in the room and you really seeking out um, support or asking questions from the classroom teachers to see the best ways to go about um, assisting our kids, it helps the kids understand that this is natural, right? It's a part of just becoming a better reader, writer, learner, speaker, and all that, and there's nothing to be embarrassed about. And building their confidence allows for them to really engage in the activities that they're doing in speech without feeling any type of way. And I've observed it not only in class when some of those activities that you've done with them are like reintroduced in class, but also observing some of your small group sessions as well. I think additionally, that communication between the subject area teachers and um, the speech therapist really allows for us to work together to build the best possible education um, plan for our kids because we get to see okay well they excel in this area they don't excel in this area how could I help them get better um, and I think that's the best way that it helps them so I think one the collaboration and coming into the room it really destigmatizes it for the kids and then two it allows for a collaborative approach for us to um, determine ways that we could best support our students Thank you so much. It's been great. What a good interview. Oh, Alrighty, bye bye. Okay. You just, coached her. You coached her. No, I'm kidding. No, she's one of my faves. She's one. Of, she's she's my work niece. This is amazing. Oh my god. No, she's she's my work niece. For okay, so do we have any questions now? Um, I want to be respectful to you, my dear. What is your name again, or how would you like to be addressed? Ayadeli. I, I ooh, so no wonder I don't remember that name. Can you spell that? A y o d e l e. A y o d e l e. Yes. It, can I just ask you what country is that from? I know it's, it's a Yoruba name. It's from Nigerian. Yeah, it's Nigerian. You know, girl, but stop. I, I'm African American, but I was born in the 70s by very Afrocentric parents. Quick Me story. Too. Quick quick story. Can I tell you this? Please. One of, one of my kids said to me the other day, like last week, because, we, you know, the solar eclipse, I'm so excited. I said, what has yeah. been Miss Higgs's favorite subject? And I yeah. thought they were going to the solar eclipse. She said black history. Wow. But but look, isn't that so good? She can make that link with me. Awesome. Yeah. She could make that association. So I was like, you go, girl. You know your speech therapist. But that was one of your clinicians or no, one of the kids. One of the kids also. One of the kids. She's she's something else. That's what she said to me. And then the other kids were like, oh. I was like, she didn't say anything wrong. I mean, she noticed something that I enjoy. If I can say something to you real fast, Ayodoli, because you know I've retired, but uh -huh. something spirit was saying, I need to come to this, to your presentation. Do you know I'm getting ready? I was in Nigeria just last year, getting ready to go back in August to Ken actually I'm speaking at a university in Kenya on our profession and okay. then with a partner of mine going on to we are Yoruba going on to Nigeria just saying I just find that so coincidental with it, no and you Yoruba yes because that's my practice is Yoruba that's interesting because you said it yes 
Yes. So, so um, Ishuna, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Oh, Miss State, wait, say your name for me. Nastasia. <laughs> Nastasia, sorry, sorry. Okay. Hi. So I work in a building um, where I service uh, students from grades six to 12. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say that it is challenging collaborating with both the middle school ELA teachers and the high school ELA teachers. Um, but one thing that I see with both grades is you have a lot of the students reading at a second and third and even a first grade reading level where you unfortunately can't use rewards, right? Because to use rewards, they must at least be, I believe, in a third grade level, reading yeah. level. Um, so some of the things that I have been working on um, is... Um, We've been doing a lot of um, identifying phonemes and trying to put the words together to form to produce a word. Um, I do a lot of visuals, but oftentimes I can get bored with them. And so what are some things that I can do that so it can keep me engaged and most importantly, keep them engaged since they're older? Well, I like LIPS as a program. I personally like it. But then say if you don't like want to like get the whole lips program, sometimes I like to have them because there is something in orthography, have them write the words and then switch a sound out, change it. And then if you could cycle them through that, like cycle them through it, almost like a Arctic program, but cycle them, just change, 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 change. If you could cycle them through that, I would say in, within a, less than a month, you should be able to move on to some multisyllabic words and see if they could move around the chunks because that'll, like, that's like, I, you could, if they could move around the chunks of the word and that would move them quicker along, in, in my opinion. And then also, I, I, maybe I didn't say this, but we can do it, but we see them like twice a week. Um, the school has to also take a part in like giving them that direct instruction because at that stage, they really need direct instruction. Mm -hmm. So, but, so you, but if I were you, like, I would just pick like, um, maybe, uh, like maybe a vowel sound and, um, and, a phoneme in the back of a word that you would oh. just keep cycling and changing because it's easy. Like most people will get the first sound, but the other sounds sometimes blur. Okay. Okay. And that's just, you know, that's my two cents, but I think you, maybe you might want to look online at lips. And then also um, a lot of the kids, they've gotten a lot of phonics through the years. Cause I know for some of my kids, this age, they must have gotten Wilson's when they were younger. But I think a lot of times they need just the practice, 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 and the whole idea of kind of studying so they can get it. Okay, great, great. Um, I'll work on that. Um, but you can only imagine I'm a little bit of a newer clinician. Um no, it's not easy. It's not easy. No, it's very challenging and also um they haven't received speech in a long time. I'm actually the first speech pathologist. Um, the other ladies are, um, they've been in the building for some time, but they weren't, they weren't able to service all the kids. Oh. So my kids have a lot of gaps in learning and then COVID didn't help. So it's like, yeah. it's a lot of work. And oftentimes I find myself discouraged and I'm overwhelmed because I'm like, I don't know which, skill to kind of work on and to tackle because they have so many deficits and it's it's like wow you know um but yeah if you well, don't mind, if, if, I'm, I'm gonna say if the deficits are stronger I'm gonna say if you find like mm -hmm. maybe go back in there I know they haven't been seen for a while but if you go back into their IEP or even go back into like their latest eval they show the deficits are stronger with the receptive side I would go harder with that because mm -hmm. you have to understand the language. You got to mm -hmm. un like, understand what the person is telling you to do. Like, mm -hmm. like 
not trying to be fresh, but that's so, so you got to get to that basic core understanding directives, you know, and, and you could always, of course, we always want to throw in that literacy component, but right. you do want to have a person who can, you know, just understand what's being, what, what they're being told. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree. Um, If you don't mind, I'll just shoot you an email from my. Oh, my no problem. Okay. Thank oh, do you, you want me to put my email in the chat? Please. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments? Anyone? Anyone? Well, with that said, I'd like to thank everyone who thought enough to come out tonight. I would like to thank all my SLP sisters, my AKA SLP sisters, my little baby sister, Amelia. <laughs> and and everyone that just thought enough to come out tonight and participate. Thank okay. you. And, and I want to leave us with that this yeah. thought. Education means emancipation. It's a light and liberty. It means uplifting of the soul of man into the glorious light of truth, the light by which men can only be made free. I think ed education you know, I'm I'm not saying everyone needs to go to college, but everyone at least needs to be literate and mm. to open their mind. Because most of uh, many, like I said, you know, I haven't solved all my life problems, but I know as a young woman, a lot of times the way I was able to find solace when I had a problem is through reading. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you certainly oh, like, you need reading, you need to understand comprehension skills to carry out life struggles and challenges and problem solve. So if you don't exactly. have that basic skill, you're doomed. And we're seeing that most of the kids, they unfortunately don't have that, uh, uh, you know, basic skill, or it's a weak skill for them. And they're not, that's why we're seeing challenges in other areas you know, in academics for them and even life. And, you know, I teach also a lot of life skills as well because I have 11th and 12th graders. So yeah. it's just, it goes ties into, you know, having that basic skill. And if I might add what they used to teach us back in the day is that children, you know, like maybe zero or whatever, three to six, five or six, or maybe older, they learn, they're learning to read, but then by the time they get to like middle school, they're reading to learn. Exactly. So it changes. They're learning to read. That's all your phonics and your, mm -hmm. your discrimination of sounds and all of that and, and, and semantics and all of that stuff coming into play because they're learning to read. But by the time they hit middle school, if not sooner, they are actually reading to learn. So exactly. you can imagine if they miss those earlier years, then how are they able to learn? It is it is very impactful and it piggybacks on everything you just said. So so thank you. Thank you for a wonderful presentation, by the way. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. I really appreciate it. Thank you. These are some, we, like, I, I use teachers, pay teachers, not like every minute. I like, but they do get a nice chunk of my money because I like the little worksheets. And mm -hmm. I also, I, I also give the kids a lot of YouTube videos. Like sometimes I have, I have an author that I love, uh, mm -hmm. Zeta Elliott, some of her books, like they'll have somebody read it and I pair it with the text and they'll do it on YouTube. I love it. And, and Zeta Elliott, her books are on audiobook too. And then colleagues networking. And last year I had a, a wonderful experience to go to the National Alliance of Black School Educators. They put on a film, Right to Read, that was in, I think the NAACP had something to do with this film where they were looking around, around the country. This is like such a huge problem with reading mm -hmm. and that, you know, that really we have, a there's a lot of work to be done yeah. all around the country. 
and that a lot of a lot of school districts are seeing that we have to bring back phonics at a young age because everyone cannot read through sight words. Everyone, like everyone doesn't have the same working memory capacity mm -hmm. right? to bring back phonics, especially students with ADHD. I found that even with my own son, this is partially how I got this uh, passion for the reading thing. He was having a hard time learning to read. I went and I took that LIPS course up in Connecticut because it was cheaper than paying them people. Mm -hmm. And then I like any read like any reading thing my supervisor exposed me to, I went to. And through tutors, through me, and through, you know, God's grace, my son is able to read on grade level. Mm, congratulations on that. That's big. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a like it could be a heavy lift for parents. So I, I do get it. Does anyone have any?